Welcome to another edition of the Injury Prevention Academy brought to you by Dorn Companies. For over 20 years, Dorn has been the nation's leading wellness-based pain management and injury prevention company. Through our customized ergonomic education, training, and tech solutions, Dorn has helped nearly 120,000 employees over that time. With an annual ROI of nearly 600%, we have saved employers over $100 million in workers' comp and healthcare costs. I'll be your host, Cheryl Roy, and we will be diving into the various facets of all things safety in the working environment. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Injury Prevention Podcast Academy, and this is Cheryl Roy with Dorn, and today's guest, I have Dr. Sally Spencer with me. Dr. Sally Spencer Thomas holds a deep commitment to not only help prevent suicide, but also to encourage people to sustain a passion for living. As a clinical psychologist, mental health advocate, and researcher, she sees the issues from many perspectives. Her heart, however, is called and her dedication to the mission unwavering due to the suicide due to the suicide of her brother. Her goal is to give voice to people who've lived through depression, addiction, and the impacts of suicide and leverage their wisdom to develop bold, gap-filling strategies and programs, approaches that empower cultural and systems change in our workplaces, education systems, and communities. Changes that support people in recovery and have a life worth living. Dr. Sally is the lead author on the National Guidelines for Workplace Suicide Prevention and president of the United Suicide Survivors International. She's an accomplished speaker with a popular TEDx talk and a White House address to her credits. When she's not flying around the world speaking and training, you can always find Dr. Sally in her fuzzy slippers at her home office with her loyal dog, Rocky, or a 12,000-foot backpacking spree through the Colorado trails. Welcome, Dr. Sally. How are you today? I'm great, Cheryl. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. I'm delighted to have you. It's my second interaction with you. So this is kind of cool to have you on. Um, what I'd like to start out with, if you can just provide a little background on how your career evolved into suicide prevention and awareness in the workplace. Yeah. So I started off in my psychologist journey a long time ago. If you count my undergraduate years, I'm talking late 80s. So i had been in the field of mental health a really long time. And actually had transitioned into leadership development as my area of focus when I lost my brother to suicide in 2004. Uh, And thank you. Yes, that was definitely like the before and after moment of Mm -hmm. of my life. Um, You know, I thought as a mental health provider, I knew a couple of things about suicide. And honestly, I had gone above and beyond to get additional training. I did an externship. My very first conference was on suicide. My very first major research paper was on suicide. So I knew that I was needing more. Um, And after my brother's death, I realized that when I dove headfirst into all the things, suicide prevention, I realized there's so much that mental health providers are not being taught that exists Mm -hmm. out there. And that if this is an area that you would think everybody was like had all the best state of the art knowledge and skills, but it's not. Many mental health providers are actually trained in fear uh, rather than how to help people. So that became part of my healing process is to figure out how how do we do better? Mm-hmm. And part of that has led me on a journey to prepare mental health providers in a way that they feel confident and compassionate rather than fearful. But a lot of it, actually, I would say, you know, 85 to 90 percent of my work is workplace based because the people most at risk for suicide were falling through the cracks. They were not seeking help. They were not even seeing their issues of despair and distress through a mental health framework. Uh, And they were dying on first attempt. And most of these most of these are men and they were working. You know, they were just working or they had immediate family member who was working. And so, you know, we quickly put together that it's actually the workplace that's the most cross cutting system. System mm-hmm. for preventing suicide death. And that has been uh, that has been the goal ever since. And it's not been an easy road, but but we're making a lot more progress today. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I know that millions of people in the U.S. are affected by mental illness. And especially I want to say in the last two years since the, ba- the pandemic, that the rate of depression has risen to like almost 33 percent and it now affects one in three adults. Um, since the pandemic, uh, how has the mental health arena changed, I guess, as far as how it's happening in the workplace these days? How is it being observed? How is it being helped? Yeah, as I mentioned, the early early strides in this was a slog. You know, nobody wanted to pay attention. Everybody was super scared. 
in terms of workplaces participating in suicide prevention efforts, or they were like, this is not our lane. You know, people need to take these things up with their doctors. And I'd be like, yeah, but they're not. And they're dying. Mm. You know, maybe you could help. But, you know, people, again, it was just too much of a mindset shift for them. But then we had some early case studies. Then we had some data to come out in like 2016 from the CDC that prioritized industry by suicide rates. And that got a lot of people's attention, but it was really the pandemic. That was the biggest inflection point of all, because there was hardly a work organization anywhere that wasn't impacted in some way or another by the disruption Mm -hmm. and the anxiety caused by the pandemic. So very, very front and center for pretty much everybody around the globe, um, what do we do? Like, how do we support our people or support our the families that are impacted by the employees at our workplace? And so that's when everybody dove in, in earnest and you know, our, our national strategy, like all of these things already existed before that happened. So we weren't creating things from nothing. We were right. you know, looking for ways to plug them in and then here we go, like we were ready. Um, and so that made a big difference. Um, that has continued today, partly because the the tail of the pandemic impact is a long tail, uh, and also because there's a some generational difference that I think it really matters. Uh, there's mm-hmm. industries everywhere that are impacted by the labor shortage, um, and so if you're going to recruit and retain emerging talent, they're looking for this. They're looking for does my employer respect all of me? Does the my employer value mental health? Because uh, if if it's not evident that they do we're not, we're not going to apply or we're not going to stay. Um, and right. so it's all part of the employee engagement package as well. Um, and, and similarly, you know, if, if employees get injured in their emotional health or their physical injury impacts their emotional health, the chances of them getting reintegrated go way up when an employer mm-hmm. sees them holistically. So it's not just the concern of the company when the employee is clocks in, clocks out kind of a thing. It's what goes home at the end of the day. It's how can companies support their employees when the work-life balance today is just so often blurred? Right. I think there was a myth that got perpetrated somewhere that we all thought was actually something we could do, which is, you know, don't bring your home life into work. Don't bring your work life into home. That's just a fallacy. We have one brain, one body. And yeah, you can try to put up boundaries, which I think is a helpful step. Like I'm not going to take work calls after five or I'm not going to, whatever. We can set up boundaries. But the truth of the matter, we're one being. We are one being. And if something's going down in our personal life that is really important and demanding our attention, like a dying parent or a trauma, Mm -hmm. like we can't shut that off. That's, that's, That's not like a little switch you can just shut off. It's all coming into work with us. And similarly, if there's a bunch of, really big conflicts or big stressors at work, it's coming home, you know, so, uh, you know, all of that's going back and forth. So it's really about how we best deal with our emotions in those states. And Mm -hmm. if there's ways that we can, you know, at least try to uh, address them in a way that's not going to disrupt either part of our, of our life in a major way. Um, We can do that through peer support. We can do that through coping strategies. Um, But to say, oh yeah, we're just going to build up a solid wall and none none will filter through the other. It's just a fallacy. Um, We're not robots. You can't just switch (laughs) and walk in. So Exactly, exactly. Uh, So yeah, and then when we look at the do more with less, do more with less, do more with less kind of mentality that we have in the United States, um, we can pretty, pretty quickly determine that we are one of the most unwell nations at our level of civilization. Like everybody else is living longer and in many cases, happier lives, and we are moving in the opposite direction. So another kind of wake up call that I think our workplaces are facing right now is that we need to do a better job of, of acknowledging the whole person because you pay now or you pay later. You pay now by giving people accommodations for mental health issues or more flexibility or more time to be with their family. Um, you, you ensure that they take vacation days or you pay later because they have all kinds of stress related health issues, heart disease, cancer, uh, or they miss work because they are experiencing depression or they've developed an addiction to cope with the stress, like much better to alleviate suffering and create workplaces that are whole worker friendly, like many of our international um, 
countries that are similar to ours have, you know, mm -hmm. people ha have much better work-life balance in other countries. And, and because of that, they have better productivity, better loyalty, better happiness, less stress, live longer, happier, productive lives. It doesn't, it doesn't take a brain surgeon to figure out like a happy employee is a loyal and productive employee. Unhappy employees, they spend a lot of time griping. <laughs> sabotaging, <laughs> doing things that are not good for their own self-interest or the interest of the company. So I know burnout has become a very large topic. And there was a recent Gallup poll that about 50% of U.S. workers are reporting stress just on a daily basis, um, mm -hmm. which would explain why the U.S. is going the wrong direction on right. all of this. Um, what do you think are the top three drives or ideas that a company needs to keep in mind when they're trying to retain employees and avoid so burnout? Yes. So burnout is not about employees behaving badly. Mm -hmm. Burnout is really about systems and culture behaving badly. So just to give people more yoga or more meditation classes does not get us in front of burnout. Mm -hmm. So what we do when we partner with companies is a couple of things. One, we want to do some root cause analysis and see from the employee perspective what are some things driving burnout and can we tweak them? You know, sometimes we can't get rid of them, but even, even sometimes the slightest tweak can have a big impact on employees. And it certainly, certainly shows good faith effort on the half of behalf of the employer to say, we realize this part of your job is driving burnout and that's not okay. And so we're going to tweak it to see if it causes less burnout. So it's sometimes it's things like, oh, uh, rotating shifts. Um, not allowing for people to sleep well. Uh, and if we, you know, so I, we learned this from the first responder community, if we rotate them the other direction, then that helps with sleep scheduling. Or if we rotate them in terms of hours worked versus days off, uh, people get to spend more time with their family or whatever it is, what the employees mm -hmm. say, if you just tweaked this part of, our, of the way our job's set up, we would be happier and healthier. Um, another one, one of my favorite ones to share was that there was this group of people and the, where, where their offices were, was in a place where there's no windows. And they said, we have no natural light yeah. and we are, we are feeling emotionally drained by this every day, just having artificial light. If you put in a couple of windows or um, somehow access us to have some natural light down here, <laughs> we will be happier. Easy fix. They were able to do that. Another group that we worked with, it was, uh, time zone differences, Mm -hmm. where this was a multinational company where one part of the world was always waking up in the middle of the night to accommodate the other part of the world. Right. And that wasn't fair. So they distributed who's waking up in the middle of the night to get on these large conference calls across the time zones. And that felt more equitable to that country that was always making that accommodation to serve the company. So things like that, right? Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that are driving um, not just physical exhaustion by hours worked, but kind of this emotional and soul exhaustion where people are like, I have nothing left to give. Yeah. I have nothing left. Because once you've crossed that barrier of I have nothing left to give, it's really hard to bring people back because the idea that you have my benevolence in mind, you have all of me, all of who I am in mind and upholding all of me. I'm not just a cog in your wheel, mm -hmm. but you know me and what I'm bringing. Um, once I feel like you violated that, I have a hard time trusting that whatever you're going to do is going to work in my best interest. So, yeah, yeah. So doing those kind of good faith things, listening first, listening deeply to what the workers are saying is driving, um, overwhelming distress and then seeing if we can mitigate that. So that's what, that's a big one. And that's probably the most important one. Um, and then I would say the other piece is to really go at this from a morale point of view at the supervisory level. So rather than frame it as a mental health issue, we've had some organizations get a lot more traction positioning this as a morale issue and saying, where is our smaller team? Where is our morale You know, this week or this month? Are we better than we were last month? Are we less? Are we lower in our morale than last month? And what's driving that change? And again, so it's a smaller group conversation, putting a finger on the pulse of something conceptually related to burnout, which is if the morale is low, then that that team is not thriving. And we can hear in small ways in, in real time and then feed that up. So get all the mid-level managers to feed up changes in morale. And then pretty quickly, we have a, a sense of if we're headed in the right direction or not. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because I know a lot of times when you hear people speak of just mental health in general, it's got a lot of stigmatic issues around it. 
in mm -hmm. general. Um, so changing the verbiage alone, I think, is probably a helpful just all the way around helpful for more people to embrace what's going on and then doing it in a smaller group. So when it's with smaller groups, how do you guys handle um, people who are working remotely now? Because obviously that's gone up uh, a ton over the year, to the last couple of years where everyone's working from home. And how do we address when we're not on site to deal with uh, morale? Yeah, I think similarly, you know, small teams are still operating for people who are remote, even though they might not be sitting in cubicles next to each other. I think people can identify like this is my team. This is, you know, the the part of the business that I'm working on. And frankly, that was going to be my third recommendation is that we have to work extra hard now with a lot of people in hybrid or remote situations to develop those deep relationships that are often fostered when we are sharing what our kids are doing over the weekend and what sports they're in and where our vacation is over the water cooler or in the hallways, you know, those little conversations that help us see each other as fully fledged human beings and get to know each other on a deeper level. While I think a lot of us love walking around in our slippers in the workday and, you know, being able to access some of the comforts from home and not having stupid commutes that eat up all our time. The downside about not being in person anymore is that we don't develop those deep relationships. And as a society in general, we can see in the United States, our ability to develop deep relationships is withering um, because of our speed and distraction and multiple demands on our time and attention. And we are hardwired to be social creatures. So we have an epidemic of loneliness. That's what the Surgeon General would say. And that loneliness is tied to all kinds of health issues, including a lot of mental health and suicide and addiction issues. So whatever can be done to foster deep relationships um, in this virtual and hybrid work situation that many still live in, uh, the better. And if that if those could be in person, maybe once a quarter or once a month and go beyond just a happy hour, that's the other kind of takeaway. They need to go beyond drinking. Um, oh, yeah. I know that's that's a big draw for a lot of people is just to have a happy hour and show up for that. But as you can imagine, um, for people in long term recovery, that's not inviting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of negative things that happen when people are overusing so rather than that, maybe think about other types of really fun team building things. I know when I was working in a large university, one of the things that we did in our kind of division was we went and had like a cooking class. So little teams learned how to cook a dish together and then we broke bread together. So it was fun. It was different than what we did every day. We got to interact and build teams and all that stuff. Ropes courses is another. I mean, there's a lot of these things that go beyond just a happier type of thing that where people can actually get to know each other. Happy hours seems easy. Um, yeah. I think the thoughtfulness put into a cooking class, actually, that's a really great idea. A cooking class mm -hmm. or I love high ropes, anything like <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that's, that's a great idea as well. Or uh, community service is another sure. place, right? Yeah. So little, little teams come together. They do something good for the community, team bonding, you know, spirit of service, mm -hmm. all kinds of good stuff. So I know that chronic pain, when people are suffering from that, whether it's repetitive movement at work or being a little more towards your your legendary years at a work site, um, people are three times more likely to be depressed uh, because they're developing chronic pain or vice versa, depending on how you look at that. Um, do you have any case studies where a company investment employees' mental health also helps with their overall workplace injury to reduce chronic pain? You know, I don't know that there's definitive research there yet now. Not anything that I can cite off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. We didn't really... We didn't really have this as a research agenda priority until like eight years ago. Okay. And if you think about how long it takes to turn around a definitive body of work, it takes, you know, 15 years sometimes. So we're still having a lot of this emerging, but I can just tell you common sense wise, it just makes sense, right? When we're, sure, when we're sure. supporting the whole being and there's very clear connections between pain and emotional well-being. That's not new. So the more again, makes sense. The more you're in significant chronic pain, the more likely you are to feel miserable all the time. And the more likely your social circles are going to shrink. It takes a lot more energy to go out and do hobbies or social gatherings when you don't feel physically great. Um, and so then eventually that withers down to you alone with your pain, which is incredibly miserable. Oh, sure. So, so, um, so there's now more effort to tie these dots together. I used to work uh, at the VA, the um, Veterans Affairs Hospital in Boston, 
And we had a pain clinic where this is exactly what we were working on was to get people who were living with a lot of pain and trying to troubleshoot pain mitigation, which was rough, not because a lot of things didn't work. And back in that area, we had far too many opiates available. So there was also like a, a lot of complications. So we really wanted to pain management for, for people that were non-medication oriented and social. So we had social groups that people who all had chronic pain, things they could do together based on their mobility. Um, we had, uh, you know, all kinds of um, emotional coping things and distraction things that helped people with, with their pain. And we really got the families involved as well. So sometimes the families not are, are not fully aware of the impact that chronic pain has on people's well-being overall and their relationships. So we had family members come in and to be part of that safety net and, and support net for people um, so that they were contributing to healing um, rather than the expectations might be driving wedges in the relationships and so on. So yeah, just like all the other issues that we have that we know that here's a root cause, um, a holistic approach, mind, body, and soul, mind, body, and spirit, uh, the, the more likely we're going to have a positive outcome. What's a I feel like it just spider legs into so many different avenues. It's hard just to call it one thing. Right. Um, my next question would be, so I would imagine the holidays towards the end of the year, things probably spike in an area that just, again, common sense kind of a thing with being with family, being without family, having to work, missing holidays, that kind of a thing. Um, I realized that you had said the construction industry is known for its really high suicide rate and like mental health issues that compounded everything else going on. Why do you think construction is so high, high risk versus a different industry? Okay. Yeah. I thought you were going to go down another, another path around the holidays. <laughs> I'll, I'll answer both. Oh, both. both uh, so. Okay. Yes. So actually during the holidays from January, uh, from Thanksgiving through January, mm -hmm. suicide rates are the lowest out of the year. So this is, really? this is a myth. Yep. This is a myth that they spike during the holidays. They actually are the lowest. Um, and they tend to spike in the spring. And when people learn that they think it's really what, but there's a lot of things that happen during the holidays that might be protective for people. So while they might feel alone, sometimes that we think maybe people will hang on to the new year to huh. see if new year's bringing new opportunities. Um, we don't really know because the people aren't here for us to ask, but Sometimes there's not an opportunity. Sometimes the family buffering does help. For whatever reason, it's the lowest in the holiday season and then spiking in the spring. Yeah, yeah. But that doesn't mean people aren't suffering. And as someone sure. who lost her loved one on December 7th, you know, I know a lot of people are suffering um, because of that loneliness, because of, you know, a goal that was set maybe for the calendar year that's now obviously not going to be made. And financial stress of all the ways we spend money during the holidays, like all kinds of things can drive people to distress and despair. So I always say myth busted, but you know, don't take your foot off the gas pedal. Like let's keep, let's keep going all the way in. Um, and think about, you know, people who may feel less grateful at this time of the year because of the challenges they're facing or may feel more isolated because of work-related stressors or health issues or whatever. Let's keep them in mind. And especially people who are grieving, I think it's it's hard. Let's create space for them. You don't have to be all cheery and want to celebrate and party. You know, your, your meaningful experience right now, whatever that is, trauma, sadness, recovery, like all of that matters and all of you matters. Um, in terms of why construction, so there are a couple of things we know for sure. And, and again, the research is emerging for the other things. What we know for sure is that men die by suicide. Um, about 75 to 80% of people who die by suicide are male. So between three and four times the amount of, of women. Women attempt more than men. Men die more than women. It's largely because men use more lethal means like firearms. Oh, wow. So all the male dominated industries have higher rates of suicide because men are working in them. But then within that list, we also have a consistent finding, which is extraction. So oil and gas, mm -hmm. mining, extraction and construction are usually number one and number two, and they, they kind of flip-flop. And so that this is the part of the evidence that's emerging, um, but it has a lot to do with pressure. Um, these are both highly profitable and huge industries that are incredibly co competitive. Mm -hmm. So the whole do more with less, do more with less, do more with less. Oh, and by the way, no problems, like no incidents, 
Certainly no safety issues uh, because the stakes are so high. So if you have a safety issue, the chances are good. Somebody's going to get seriously injured or yeah. die. Um, and if you have a mistake, there's a chance that you're going to jam up production. It's going to cost millions of dollars. So because of that pressure, because of the travel, because of the pain involved with the, with the physical labor and the risk of injury, because of the permissiveness around substance use and the overprescription of opiate-based medications, there's just like a perfect storm of stressors in these industries um, that then contribute, in addition to being a male-dominated industry, uh, having the highest rates within all of the male-dominated industries. Interesting. Okay. Um, I'm going to wrap up with one more question for you. Uh, if you are a company that's got more budgeting issues on the smaller side, let's say 50 or less employees, and they've got limited resources, but they do want to help their workers the best they can with mental health. How do smaller companies go about doing so where they're able to get in there? It's a little more uh, private because it is a smaller company. I would wonder if, how do you navigate being helpful without feeling invasive to people? Okay, again, multiple questions in your I last know. question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so how, do, how does a smaller employee employer navigate this? Um, so first of all, a smaller employer has something going for them, which is community. It's mm -hmm. much easier to form bonds in a group of 35 to 50 people than it is 50,000 people, right? It's more just intimate. a different, mm -hmm. different, right, more intimate, more family feel, and that's massively productive in terms of protective factors when it's working well, when it's highly conflictual, yeah, it's probably gonna be even more disruptive because it's gonna feel more personal being so small. Uh, but there's a lot of things a small employer can do. First of all, uh, they can get an employee assistance program. I was a CEO of a company of eight people and we were able to afford an employee assistance program at the highest level um, because it was a small number per person per month. And the benefit was huge. And every single one of my employees used it because, well, we were a mental health organization and they valued it greatly. So there are ways to bundle small employers who can bundle together uh, and work with an EAP in that bundle Okay. and check with your, your local providers. But as a benefit and also a symbolic gesture of the employer to say your, you and your family's well-being matters, that is a, a, low, a low cost investment related to other things. And then you guys still market it and make sure people can trust it. But that's a that doesn't that's not going to reduce your budget to nothing. It's it's a right. small overall cost. Um, I would also say that small employers be active in some of their local professional associations. So many of the, let's just say construction, for example, professional associations have like cut and paste. Like grab and go kinds of um, toolbox talks or trainings, webinars you can download. So you can get people access to content and training without having, again, to invest a ton of money. Frankly, most trainings are so cheap and nobody gets into this work to be rich or famous. Sure. Most, of, most of us are nonprofits that got into this work because we care. And because we see that lives can be saved if we just do a couple of small things. Right. So I think people throw up, we don't have time or money because they're afraid when really it doesn't take much of either to really make a big difference. There are small things that even the smallest employers can do that. I mean, as a, at the very least, hang up a 988 poster in the bathroom stalls. You know, there's just some things that are just take very little effort and time, but can make a huge difference for people. Of course it can. And 980, be. for the people who don't know, is our uh, National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. That's free, universally accessible, 24 seven, open to all. Um, and immediately people get connected to crisis call counselors that can de-escalate a situation and help create a plan for safety for now. Excellent. So Dr. Sally, if somebody wanted to reach out to you to get more information uh, about how you run your programs or maybe just some generic questions, how can they get a hold of you? The best way is probably through the website and then you can link to all other ways of communication that work well for you. So Sally Spencer Thomas.com. I'm also on all the social media platforms. My phone number and email are readily accessible everywhere. So my name.com. 
Excellent. I want to thank you so much for making the time today, Dr. Sally Spencer Thomas. Uh, it's been wonderful having you on here with our Injury Prevention Academy. And I wish you a happy holiday. I hope everything goes well for you rolling into 24. Thanks, Cheryl. You too. All right. Take care. Bye.